Pastor Mariah. Good morning. How are you today? Isn't it a beautiful day? Oh, it's going to be nice outside today. Aren't you glad for some warm weather? How many are glad for the warm weather? Yeah, I do love trees. So everybody knows I love trees, you know, so, you know. But we're continuing on with the series on how to overcome insecurities. Um, and it's very important, you know, a, a few months ago I was in prayer and I heard a voice, and I knew it was a voice I'm familiar with, the Lord. And I know His voice because I'm familiar with it. You know, you know, if I live in the house, and I'm not supposed to elaborate a lot because it could go a little longer, but you understand the voice of your wife. You know your wife's voice. You know your son's voices, your daughter or whatever, or your friend's voice. You can also learn to recognize the voice of God. And he still speaks today, my friend. God still speaks. And I heard a voice, and the voice says, you, you need to deal with some insecurities uh, to me as a pastor. And I'm thinking, I don't have any insecurities right now. What's wrong? No, that's wrong. And, you know, God began to deal with me and show me a couple of things I needed to work on. So if I need to work on it, maybe you do. All right, there we go. But, you know, I'm just, I'm just kind of kicking this off, and we have the amazing panel here. Give them a big hand today. The brave, the bold, the... Amazing. Uh, one of the biggest things that, that I've had to fight in my life is the fear or dread of rejection. Come on, has anybody ever dealt with the fear of rejection? I don't literally even think in my life it's just been a fear in the past, but it's more of the dread of it. Um, let me say that the biggest issue in the past for me has been the fear, dread of rejection, but deal with the fear first so you can deal with the rejection. Okay, I'm going to read this off or else I'll go too long. Second Timothy 1 7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. So the fear of rejection is rooted in fear, right? A lot of it or the dread of it. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love and of a sound mind. The fear of not having the power to do what you need to do. The fear of not being loved and accepted by people. The fear of not having a strong mind. My mom went crazy about my age. Well, it was earlier than that. It was probably in her 40s. But you know what? I'm never going to go crazy, right? But the thing is, you have to, you have, sometimes, what did Paul say? We fight the good fight. What does that mean that this life is? It's a fight. I have to go in the trenches sometime and fight things. Do you ever get in the trenches sometime to fight things? And you just have to brutally fight, fight, fight. But then you always win if you don't quit or give up. And that's the key. Now listen, James 4, 7 says this. Where's fear based out of? Where's fear come from? God has not given us a spirit of fear. So fear is rooted in, in evil, in the devil, in darkness. So whenever fear hits you like that, you have the right, because of your authority in Christ, to be able to resist that. Amen? James 4, 7 says, submit yourself to God. What's that mean? Well, I pray about that sometimes. Say, what do you mean submit yourself to you? And he says, worship me, pray, seek my face, submit to me, submit to my word, right? Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. If you allow fear, the fear will stay until you do something about it. Fear doesn't leave until you do something about it. But if you don't do something about that fear of rejection, it will grow, it will grow, it will grow. Fear in itself will grow if you don't do something about it. Never in the Bible did Jesus say for you to ask him to do something about the devil. He never did. He said for you to do something about the fear. And it's fear is based and rooted in darkness. Is that right? It's not always a fear, though. Sometimes it's more like being repulsed by rejection. It goes beyond fear sometimes in my past where the feet, because as a child I, was, I had six stepfathers. I was abused. So with the, with the traumatic events of my teenage years and before my teenage years caused me to feel a lot of rejection. So there are times even now when that tries to hit me, and, but I have to fight the good fight of faith. I have to push it away. I said, when are you going to have to quit fighting? When you're gone. <laughs> when you're not on the earth. A lot of ministers won't talk about some of these things because they don't want to get up in front of people and talk about their weaknesses. But what did, what did Paul said, say about God's grace? And what did God say back to Paul? My strength is made perfect in your weaknesses. Wow. 
Okay, one of my stepfathers refused to buy me clothes for school. So, you know, as a young man, you know, you want to be cool in school. Well, I didn't have clothes to wear. So I went to school with the same clothes on over and over and over. And a group of three girls, I never forgot them. See, I never forgot this group of three girls. <laughs> oh, I was girls. But three girls would always make fun of me at school and humiliate me in front of everybody that I didn't have enough money to buy clothes. It was a great rejection, a time of rejection in my life. We also didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up, so I ate on government aid where they pay for your lunch. All right? I had two close friends that were girls, again. <laughs> I was 13. I had This was when I was 13. And I, but, you know, I never forgot it. And, and if, if I think about it too long, I can still feel the sting of it. How many of you can go back to an event in your life and if you think about it too much, you feel the sting of it? Now, let me go on. I'm going to show you how to get over the sting of it, right? And if, But this, what I'm saying to you now, these are bullet points for another message I'll be doing later, but this is the intro for today, all right? But I'm going to be teaching more on this later, all right? We didn't have a lot of money. I ate on government aid. I had the two close friends that were girls. We were really close friends. And then one day the teacher said, everyone who's eaten on government aid, raise your hand. And, and I literally was gripped with fear, thinking if I raise my hand now, I'm going to lose my friends because they had money. And, and, and I was shaking. I just remember sitting there. And I raised that hand up. And when I did, that was the last day they were my friends ever again. They rejected me. And so from all I went through in life, that has been something I've had to overcome. Even every so often, I can feel that pressure. But you know what? God has not given you a spirit of fear, the fear of rejection, but a spirit of love, power. If I can overcome it, you can, my friend. Because I probably had a lot worse life than you had when you were growing up. And I'm not saying I don't want to compare lives, but I'm saying I, it was brutal. I've had, I had a sh I've had guns stuck to my body, all kinds of stuff you can imagine threatening to blow my guts out when I was a kid. Kids shouldn't have to go through that. Yeah. But that rejection tries to stick to you. But you do not have to live haunted by the fear of rejection. Amen? The rejection hurt. One time we ran out of food completely for three days. I'm going to ask this. How many of you ran out of food for three days at your house? Is there anybody in this church right now or listening online? You can raise your hand online. Just kidding. Anybody here today says, I ran out of food when I was a kid for three days. I'm a kid. My mom didn't even say anything to me. We just didn't have food. She didn't even say a word to me. She didn't even say, honey, I'm sorry. We don't even have food in the house. So guess what? I just had to figure out a way to survive. Rejected by every stepfather. One of them tried to send me to military school. I ran away from home because I was rejected. Guess who came and found me? Because my mama tried, probably told him she was going to kill him if he didn't find me. You didn't mess with my mama because she'd shoot you. And I ain't kidding. <laughs> my mom was brutal. One time we ran out of food for three days. It was 1980. I found myself heating up a bottle of ketchup and eating it like soup. And a little rabbit hopped in the yard, and I took my shotgun out, and that was the end of the fast. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> when you're three days, you ain't ate nothing, buddy, and a little rabbit's hopping out in the yard, and you see rabbit chops, fried rabbit chops. But the fear of rejection leads to behaviors that make us appear insecure, ineffective, and overwhelmed. You might sweat. You might shake, fidget, <laughs> avoid eye contact. You don't want to look at people because you've been rejected. And even lose the ability to effectively communicate with people. I was reading some practical ways to get over rejection from a leading author on the subject this week. And one thing that stood out to me that I thought was incredible was they said you, you, you can't negative self-talk. If you negative self-talk and you talk down on yourself to other people and to your own self, it only digs the hole deeper. But that lines up with the Word of God, doesn't it? Doesn't it? You can literally talk yourself into being joyful. I do it almost every other day. When I wake up, I don't feel happy most days. 
I don't feel happy, my friend, but my feelings can lie. See, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. So if I walk by faith, I walk by who God says I am and who he, what, how he sees me. It's not how you see me. It's not how anybody else sees me. It's by how the Father sees me. Amen? But you can literally talk yourself into being happy. I stand in the mirror a lot of mornings, and I feel depression trying to just trying to hit me in the face. And you know what I do? I look in the mirror, and I say, I'm a happy, 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 happy. You think that's funny, and I do, and it is funny because I get to laughing at my own self sometimes. But you know what? I look in the mirror and I say, You are happy today. And I refuse to let you be anything else because God said, The Bible says, His joy is my strength. So I hold on to that, to that. But there have been times in my life where I would hit places where depression would be hitting me so hard in the last. 29 years of marriage where I just wanted to go bury myself in a hole and never come out. But every time I overcame, I said, every time I overcame, I said, every time, every thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ. Amen. All right. I'm winding this down here because I'm not supposed to be preaching this morning. Right. Remember, you can talk yourself into joy or into sadness. Say what God says about you. Believe it. Say it. Live it. The greatest doctor is Dr. Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by what we see or you could say feel. In other words, we walk by what we believe about ourselves, not by our feelings. Feelings can and will lie to you. So we walk by God's truth. What does God say? Who does God say you are? Because that's what we should believe and say. Joy spreads, and I'm wrapping it up with this, joy spreads joy, so give some joy today. Be like my dog Boomer. He brings joy whenever I see him because he's always so excited to see me. Amen. So I wanted Russ to share with you a little bit about what God had dealt with him about regarding insecurities because so often I feel we as ministers, those on a ministry team, aren't transparent. And I think it's our transparency that helps us identify that we've all got things we deal with, right? And so that's why we're here. These guys, thank you guys, are willing to open up their lives and share with you their insecurities, what they've dealt with in life, but also how they've overcome. Amen? And so we have Don and Kevin Jelly. They're on our pastoral team. They're also our pastoral care pastors. We have the wonderful Miss Paula Derby. Her and her husband, Bob, give a wave, Bob, are also pastors here at Church at Glass Chapel. And and we have the lovely Mariah White, who is over our women's ministry and also our greeters. And so with that, we're going to kick right off. And I'm going to ask first, Paula, what is it that you're dealing with? A negative self-image. I really did not know who I was. That's good. Mariah, what's insecurity we're asking with you today? Um, not being smart enough to fulfill my calling that God, that I felt like God had called me to and body image. Don, what has been a great challenge in your life? If I could write a book about my greatest challenge, this would be the title. Thunder Thighs, I Believe the Lies. <laughs> with, with, a, with, a sub, with a subtitle of Exposing Negative Body Image. Oh, how can I keep going after that? that was awesome, right? Okay, uh, Pastor Kevin, what, what, what has tried to hold you back, <laughs> my friend? Are you on? Is your mic on? Because I can't hear you. Yeah, it's on. There we go. Hold your hand up on the mic. You have to hold. No. No. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Said hold my hand up. Um, for for me, it's. I'm sure that most every man in this room, it's been finances and providing for your family as a father and a husband. Uh, the insecurity that you feel when you can't. And when you make mistakes, that you see your family suffer financially. So good. Okay, now we're diving right in. So you've heard our topics. We've got body image, finances, self-image, and not being smart enough. And so with that, I'm going to turn to Dawn. Okay, Dawn, how is it that you came to this book title? <laughs> That's good. What's the reason for right. writing? <laughs> Pastor talked. Oh, okay. Pastor talked. It's him. No, just kidding. Pastor talked about, um, you know, overcoming and that the enemy, the scripture that 
that stands out in my mind is the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and I've come to give life and life more abundantly. I think too often we don't realize that he comes to steal. You know, if you, if you, if you get a thief, a thief doesn't start and just steal a car one day. They start by stealing money out of their mom's purse. Well, maybe some of the kids we worked with stole a car. I don't know. But, you know, they start small. They start with a small thing. They, they steal small. And Satan, uh, not to give him more credit, but, but he starts when you're young. He's after you and the call of God in your life and your relationship with Christ since you're, when you're young. And mine started when I was young. Um, I lived in a, I love my parents. They, are, they love me. They're good parents. But mine started in my home. Um, I lived in a very critical home, a very nothing was ever good enough home. I didn't notice until I was an adult that my mom was her own insecurities that came off on me. But I didn't realize that. They were her insecurities. Um, I lived in a very harsh home. The words that were spoken were always in harsh tones. Now, I knew I was loved. My parents both loved me. They told me that. But they didn't know how to express their love. I was never told by my dad, you know, you're affirmed, you're, you're beautiful, you're, you're any of those things. And so I, I really believe it started at a young age. And then I actually was probably a foot taller than everybody in my grade school. Um, and, and people made fun of that. You're, you're bigger. Well, I wasn't bigger. I didn't know that until I was an adult. I was just average. But I felt bigger. When you're taller than the boys, you feel bigger. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. And then I, I literally had people say things to me, which kids are cruel. You talk about rejection, but kids are cruel. And I had, I had people say things to me really like, why are your thighs so big? It's not, that's not an exaggeration. Those are exact words. And I had people say, you know, if you just lose some weight, you could be this. Well, I didn't hear you could be this. I heard if you just lose some weight. And you guys, I wasn't fat, but I thought at that point I was fat. Now I look back, and I'm like, oh, wow, I wasn't. <laughs> But, but, it, but it started to just, the enemy steals. So little by little, he kept stealing my body image away from me, stealing the person who I was away from me. It wasn't this all of a sudden aha moment. It was a little by little he was stealing. And I'll, you talk about those feelings. I'm almost cry about this because when you're talking about your feelings, I, it's so real. When you replay these things in your mind, when I was a junior in high school, and I played sports my whole life, and my dad and mom never came to my stuff, so you just don't have that support. But I'm a junior in high school on the Fayette field and this kid I think about it now I could have beat the snot out of him he's so little but he yells across the Fayette field to me specifically and says hey thunder thighs that's where my book title came from and it, I mean you're embarrassed you're you're humiliated but you laugh it off you're like hey yeah funny yeah joke it wasn't funny it tore me apart and I spent the rest of my life fighting that image that was created in me because I didn't know what we're going to talk about next, how to get out of that. I didn't know how to not believe those lies. I didn't know how to step away from, that's not a truth. That's somebody else's perspective, not God's. So that's where my book title came from. Yeah, that's good. That's good. My uncle always called me. I was working out a lot when I got out of the military. That's good stuff. And uh, I, was, I was in good shape, you know. Coming right out of the military, I was pretty beefy, but... You know, I walked into my uncle. He taught me how to hunt. I owe a lot to my uncle. I, I'm not bashing him, but he had a bad mouth. And even though people love you, he was the only father figure I had, but he always brutalized me with his words. But he was the only person who showed any care as a man figure. So I gravitated to him. You know what I mean? He was the only man that was a man that actually was with his wife, that actually had a family, that was together. So I did have a lot of respect for him, but he did brutalize me with his tongue often. And he said to me one day, I walked in, I was feeling good coming back from the army, all beefy. He said, man, son, you got a big old body and a little pinhead. <laughs> and, you know, ever since that day, I had to fight thoughts that I had a little tiny pinhead. So, you know, you just, you have to push those things out. That's good. Kevin, tell me, how's that, how did those, those things that tried to hit you, insecurities about finances, providing for your family affect you and what you do, you know? Well, I'll tell you this, it affects me a lot more now than it did 25 years ago. You know, as a young person, you don't think about what it's gonna be like when you're 57. Yes, I'm 57. Um, you think, I got my whole life in front of me, I got these plans, I got these dreams, I, I got a plan to m be successful. And then life goes on and things change and those plans fail or you screw up or uh, life doesn't go like you're, you're going to do. You had it all planned out. And so um, as you move on, sometimes you have to let dreams go. 
I had to let my dream of being an NBA star go. <laughs> I thought that was a realistic plan. Um, okay, I didn't, but that's all right. Um, but you do have dreams that you have to change as you get older and things don't work out the way you go. But there are still dreams that you have in your heart. And the hardest thing that I have had to fight is hanging on to those dreams that you know God, God's put dreams in my heart from when I was a kid that I haven't seen yet. And my decisions, my screw-ups, my mistakes have all gone against those dreams. And how to move forward knowing where God wants you to go, but not knowing how you're going to get there, but yet trusting that he is going to help you get there, no matter what your mistakes are. That's what I've, that, that's how it's affected me. And not letting the pressure, the enemy coming in, because the enemy comes in with little thoughts, in a series of little thoughts. And they're little thoughts that slowly wear you down, and they'll change uh, how you see what, you know, Kevin, you screwed up today. What'd you do this for? Now you're not going to be able to do this. Now you, now you can't do that. And slowly by slowly, it wears you down. And you have to fight that, that uh, because that's where you get insecure, because the more you get beat down, the more insecure you get about different things. And the more mis- and I've made about every mistake you can make as far as finances, trust me. I have, and I'm still paying today for some of them. And, um, but yet I know God is, is still on my side. Amen. I know he's good, and he's going to help us move on to the next step. So. so good. Isn't this good? So what we're doing here right now is just putting it out there, what we're dealing with, and then we're going to come back around, and we're going to share with you truths from the word of God to help you deal with the things you're dealing with as well. And I just I appreciate you guys. I appreciate the transparency. I mean, how many of you look at Don Jelly and just think she's this fabulous, gorgeous woman? I know I do. You would never think that's her battle, right? And that's how it is with people. I look out at you all, and I would probably be shocked if I, if I knew your battle, right? And so I think this really helps us all. Okay, so Mariah, I, I, I love what Mariah is willing to share because I've walked all these years with her, <laughs> and I've seen her battle this, and I know the victory that came out of it. And so thank you. For so I, when I was younger... Um, I always doubted that I was smart and you know I was ha- always had to work a little harder at school than everybody else and so that doubt was already there fast forward to graduate high school feel like God has called me to be a nurse start nursing school and I find out that nursing school is very hard <laughs> and uh, um, that doubt that insecurity of not being smart enough was already there so a couple years into nursing school I was really really struggling with it and I had multiple teachers tell me to change my major because I was not smart enough to be a nurse. So with that doubt already being there, and then, I mean, these are my professors, I'm going to them for their office hours saying, can you please help me? Can you please explain this to me? I don't understand. And they say, actually, you should just change your major because you're not smart enough to be a nurse. You know, that's hard. And then for me, I felt like God had called me to be a nurse. And I just am, I mean, I'm beside myself. How can I ever fulfill my calling if I am not smart enough to be a nurse? And um, so praise God for my mom and Judy Joe and another lady in my life who always affirmed me and who always told me, no, this is what God says about you. You have the mind of Christ. You all, you have all wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And so fast forward another year, it's my senior year of nursing school. I have one year left. And the dean of nursing, the dean herself, called me in her office and told told me I would never be a nurse. I was not smart enough to be a nurse and I needed to drop out now. And I didn't, I told her I wouldn't do that. And so we kind of got into it because I wouldn't back down. And at that point I had gained a little confidence that insecurity was still there. And, but so then she tried to kick me out and I wouldn't do it. And so I went to the president and this is at a Christian college and you don't expect this stuff at a Christian college. And so I went to the president and I was like, look, this is what's going on. Will you help me? And he helped me. And, um, all that to say, I stayed in nursing school, graduating nursing school. And then my biggest fear was you have to pass a licensing test and again that fear is there I'm not smart enough I can't do it and I didn't pass um, that first time I took it I did not pass the NCLEX and I was 
devastated. I thought I had wasted four years of my life. I thought I had not heard God's calling for my life. I was devastated. And uh, through college and then especially during this process, you know, when you believe a lie, it's not just the narrative in your head. It manifests physically. And I started having panic attacks. And, um, you know, your body reacts to what you're focusing on. And I was so focused on this lie. I was stressing myself out, having panic attacks, and then you know, not sleeping, acne's all over your face, your stomach's always upset because you're so nervous and you're so upset because you're never going to fulfill what God has called you to do. And that was a reality for me because I didn't pass my NCLEX. And I'll never forget it. I might cry. But I, we were at an Inspired Woman conference here. We had just bought this building, and it had been six months since I had taken the NCLEX, and I had walked away from everything that it, God had called me to, everything. And I knew it, and my mom knew it, Judy Jo knew it, and but I, I walked away, and I was in that second row, and the Lord said, Mariah, it's time. Mariah, it's time. It's time to pick up the boxing gloves and keep fighting. And that was, that was the exact words he said to me. It's time to pick up the boxing gloves and to keep right. fighting. And so I did and took the NCLEX again, passed it, and now I'm a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> Woo man, we need to just write books from all these stories, man. And she's a nurse who they keep asking to be over the department and begging her to stay and do more. And I keep saying no. <laughs> My, my college teacher, English college teacher, looked at me after I wrote my first paper, and she said to me, my God, son, you're the worst writer I've ever seen in my life. And I'm like, thank you, thank you. And, but, but what I do, I have to write a lot. I'm a teacher. So now look at that. Now I have to write. But you st those words sometimes try to sting me. But you know what? God, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Without Moses, I'm talking to somebody right now. Listen, because there's a word from God for somebody right now. I feel it. I sense it. It's in my spirit. I know when this happens. It's like something changes inside of me. Without Moses' 40-year wilderness experience, he never would have become the deliverer of Israel. Sometime in your wilderness, instead of crying and begging, and I've done it, man. I've been there where you've been and crying on the floor. God, you got to do something. And God's like, come on, get up. Come on, praise me. Come on, pray. Come on, put the boxing gloves back on. Amen? Without Moses' 40-year wilderness experience, he never would have become who he was called to be. So when you're going through a wilderness experience, hallelujah, there's a bright light at the end of that tunnel, baby. But what did J David say? In the middle of the roughest times of his life, yet will I praise him. Yet will I praise him. I'll praise him no matter what's going on. I'm going to praise the Lord. Amen? And that's faith. She told me not to preach, but I just had to, just a little bit. Okay, it's Paula Derby's time. What does the conversation about self-image sound like in your head? Well, my, um, I've actually never shared this publicly before. You uh, mean you've never, ever stated what you're about to say? Yes. Publicly? Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> My self-image took a massive hit when I was nine and a half. Um, I started losing my hair. I would wake up in the morning to gobs of hair on my pillow. You know, ladies, you run your hands through your hair, and you get a strand or two, right? If I did that, I got a handful. My hair was very long, and um, in my family, a girl's worth was her appearance, period, over and out. My dad's sister was Miss Jacksonville. She was going for Miss America. She was very beautiful. Um, my family was very dysfunctional. My father was a sometimes violent alcoholic. He was always drunk at night, but sometimes he was violent. I had been picked up and thrown into a wall from outside into the house. Um, and I never had any, and it's, so relate to your story because I never had any positive messages ever and I never heard I was compassionate or kind you know those character traits that children need to hear to build a sense of who they are and I never heard I was smart or particularly talented at anything I was reading at four 
I never even heard, wow, you read so well. There were just no positive messages at all. There was basically nothing. And as I was preparing to speak today, it dawned on me, when I was losing my hair, my parents never had a conversation with me about it. I have three daughters, I've got seven grandchildren. I cannot imagine not ever sitting a young girl down or a kid going through something heavy and not even asking how I was doing or how I felt about it or what I was dealing with. They had no idea. The adults talked about it in whispers. My grandfather called my wig my hat. I started wearing a wig when I was 11. This was about 1967. <laughs> wigs looked like Halloween wigs, <laughs> if they were synthetic. Hyper shiny, oh, they were horrible. So I wore real hair wigs. They did not make wigs for little kids' heads. They do today. In doing a little bit of study, because I know a woman here in town who also has alopecia, which is what it's called, um, she uh, posted some hashtags. I began following them. And I was shocked how many children have alopecia. They sometimes just lose part of their hair, and sometimes they lose all the hair on their body. And they have these cute, cute, cute wigs. I had to wear wigs that didn't fit my head. They were real hair. So, you know, in the humidity, part of my hair would frizz because it's multiple people's hair. And part wouldn't. <sighs> Self-image. So I kind of had this perfect storm. You know, I had this, this rare disease. No one really, uh, no one talked about it. There were no support groups in the late 60s. There was AA. That was it. So there was no one to talk to. There was no one to, sh <sighs> nobody was like me. And we don't talk about it. And I've given this message that, that I have to keep it a secret. And sometimes my wig came off in public. Usually it was in gym class. <laughs> it was real hard going. You got to hate gym class, you know. <laughs> and if my teacher knew about it, if I ran around too much playing field hockey and I'd sweat, the wig would really get loose. So she would find something else for me to do, but then you have to explain it. I mean, I was always on the outside looking in. And when my wig would come off in public, I remember um, <laughs> the first time it happened, I was in eighth grade. I had the standing broad jump to do. It was the presidential fitness thing. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember that. <laughs> I jumped to five feet. My wig jumped to six feet. There were 60 girls in line, and the gym was full of people. And it felt like the world stopped turning, and no one said anything, no one moved, no one came to my aid. I just got up and put my wig on my head and went to the next thing I was supposed to go to. And no one ever, to this day, <laughs> ever said anything about it. It happened in gym class. Other times later, <laughs> um, I was, um, I, here's the message. I am defective. I am inferior. No one will ever love me. Um, I did not fit in, and I was never going to fit in. And my family gave me a very clear message that no one would ever marry me. I did say I married, I have three daughters and seven grandchildren, right? <laughs> but God. I want to be someone, the first one to say something about that. I'm sorry for what you went through, right? And I'm sorry for what anyone in this room is going through. But you know what I can stand here and say? I personally don't know in this country anyone who's had a worse childhood than my own husband. I personally don't know. People have been through it. These guys are willing to share, but look, look where they are. 
right? And so what's the answer to that? No matter what you're going through, it doesn't dictate where you're going to be, right? If you choose not to let it. From being married to this man, people can come tell me their sad stories, and I can look at them and say, yeah, and that doesn't give you an excuse not to follow God's plan for your life. Amen? And so what we're talking about here is really quite a victory path, right? Because Paula is one of the greatest counselors I know to this day. Amen? And she let what she went through become her testimony that's changed so many lives. Amen? And that's the story here. So, Mariah, you share with us the turning point for you that changed it. So the turning point for me, I think, was just... I mean, like we all know, is don't believe the lie. It is a lie. If I have to shout it from the rooftops, it is a lie. And what I realized is my truth was opposite of the lie. And so your truth is opposite of the lie that you're believing. You're believing you're not smart. Actually, you are smart. You believe that you're isolated. No, actually, you have a community. You believe you're not lovable. No, you are lovable, right? You believe you're poor. No, actually, you're rich. So your truth is opposite of the lie you're believing. And that had to become a reality to me. And um, in that, I... The other big thing I learned is you have to watch the narrative going on in your head because that will just feed the lie. And I came across a scripture this week, and I've never read it before, but I was like, that is so good. It's Proverbs 16, 24. It says, gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Isn't that so good? So So that is telling you right there your narrative is gracious words are like a honeycomb honeycomb is healing it decreases inflammation it has healing things in it so gracious words be gracious to yourself be gracious to yourself because the things that i would say in my mind i would never say to anybody ever ever i would look in the mirror and we're gonna get real here i would look in the mirror and say you're an idiot you're dumb like just like that to myself you're a fat pig. No one will ever love you. Right? Those are realities. But you have to watch that narrative and say, actually, I'm not going to go there. And I'm going to force myself to look in the mirror and say, no, Mariah, you're beautiful. You are loved. You are smart. And I have scriptures written on my mirror to remind me of that. And, uh, you know, I talked about it manifests physically. I had panic attacks. And um, once I graduated nursing school, those kind of decreased. But they still pop up. And I have to know how to handle those. And I have to know, okay, why why am I reacting this way? What is going on? And it's been like six weeks ago. I was sitting and I was going to get my hair done at Robbins. And I was sitting in the parking lot full-blown panic attack no idea why full-blown panic attack and I was like okay you can do this get yourself together and um, my mom always used to say my last name is white whites are strong whites are not quitters get up and be strong and you have to sometimes tell yourself that my emotions will lie to me get up you can do this you are strong and so I just would encourage you to watch the narrative in your head because that feeds the lies and gracious words are a honeycomb. Gracious words are healing to you. And listen to your physical body, nurse here. Listen to what's going on physically in your body because it's a huge key. It's a huge insight to what's going on up here. And so that's my encouragement to you. So good. Okay, Paula, now you tell us how you changed the narrative as well. Um, so I was 18 when I came to the Lord, and I was a crumpled, shredded mess. Um, I was on the brink of a nervous breakdown, actually, uh, for a lot of reasons. My home life was a big factor, but the years and years of, of humiliation, of feeling so isolated and so alone, in fact, what actually crops up out of that time frame most of the time for me is... I, I have to do this alone. It's all up to me. And it doesn't really matter what it is. It's hard for me to remember I have a community sometimes. Uh, it takes my daughter Emily to remind me on regular occasions. <laughs> but I, I had no sense of who I was. And be, partly, uh, here's, the, here's one of the add insult to injury. I never had any positive 
words fed to me and character traits and all that, my main love language is words of affirmation. <laughs> you know, I didn't know that till many years later, but uh, there was a dearth of, you know, a vacancy of, of words that would help me to understand who I am. And teenagers especially are going through that time where they're trying to figure out who they are. Mm -hmm. And they're attaching with their peer groups, and we see a great um, increase in teenagers hurting themselves, cutting themselves, killing themselves, because they attach to their group, and you don't want to be different. And so whatever is popular, you, you want to be a part of that. Well, I could look in the mirror every day and know that didn't apply to me. And, and I had to get up and make it happen every day. And so um, when I received the Lord, uh, and I had knew nothing about Jesus, really. He was a myth to me because I was unchurched. But my life was falling apart, and the Lord had a friend come to me that I went through high school with. What I didn't share is that in my senior year of high school in February in Washington, D.C., I decided I wasn't wearing my wig anymore. They didn't make hats for my head. And it was snowy and cold. <laughs> and I walked to school. <laughs> and I was nervous this morning and to share this. And um, I realized, well, I went to school that day in the dark. It was, I walked to school, and it was dark out. And I could hear the other people walking, too, on sidewalks. And um, the light, the, the, it started to get lighter and lighter as I got close to school. And, um, you know, I had made this decision, and, and, and it was a resolve that was in me that I wanted to be in control of this. If I was going to reveal it, I wanted to be the one to reveal it and not have it happen by accident. It was empowering. It was frightening, <laughs> but it was empowering. And, um, and I walked into school that day with a bunch of people that, I mean, I, I went to school with 2,000 students. And... Um, you know, the, the stares and the looks. I could almost feel people I couldn't see looking at me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I just kept my face straight, and I walked on to the usual spot where I met my best friend. And um, eventually school became the safest place to be because people got used to me. My dad told me the people who have never been your friend are going to want to be your friend all of a sudden. He was right because it was cool to be seen with this girl, right? And people who have been your friend won't be your friend anymore, and he was 100% right, except for my best friend, Faye, who is still in my life. Um, but my life was falling apart, and I, was, I, I had no foundation to build a life on, and I was about to launch into the world, too, so I'm falling apart. My friend calls. I'm on the brink of a nervous breakdown. She comes over. She shares Jesus with me. Not long after that, I began to discover that I'm in union with Jesus, that I am as loved as Jesus is. I am as worthy of belonging as Jesus is as anyone is. I, one is I'm as loved by God. I mean, he, God does not love me less then he loves Jesus. He does not love you less. He loves you just as much. You are just as received as Jesus. You are just as welcomed as Jesus. You're seated at God's right hand in the heavenly places in him. I found my identity in him. And if you wonder why I teach on that all the time, here's, your, here's my why. Because you have to find yourself in him no matter what it is you're dealing with, your worth, your value, is only to be found in him. And, and I want to say, too, that um, I, I love that you pointed out that, that our bodies respond to these beliefs. Uh, beliefs have emotions attached with them. What you believe, you feel. Uh, have you ever worried deeply about something? You felt something, didn't you? You felt fear or despair or hopelessness? Well, when you allow yourself to do what Abraham did, Abraham in Romans 4 persuaded his heart that what God said would come to pass. He persuaded his heart that what God said 
was the truth. No matter what he thought, what he felt, or what he was experiencing. And I learned to go there. I meditate in who I am in Christ, who Jesus is, because as he is, so am I in this world. Not later, but right now. I can experience that today, and how we experience it, too, is going into our heart with Jesus. Take that thing that you feel the most insecure about. Insecurity is lack, and insecurity is an identity problem. That's really what it is. So take that thing, go into your heart with him, meditate on a scripture that gives you the answer to that, and don't rush the process. Let yourself feel, because as you believe, the feelings will follow. The feelings accompany it. So when you're meditating, and I have a daughter who has a very dangerous disease. It could kill her. She's got five kids under the age of seven. She's doing... Don said. <laughs> said that could kill her. <laughs> no, but, but the fear that gripped me around her took me years to take that fear to that place, knowing that God is able to keep what I have committed to him. He is able to, and, and you meditate in these things until your feelings begin to show up. Because when we just meditate in them, we're just a want, 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 you know, like the Charlie Brown teacher, you know? Because we're just a little yak, yakety yak, don't talk back, when all we're doing is just spitting scripture out. But take a scripture and take it into your heart with Jesus until you feel the feelings. And this is really how I got to a place where I believed that I had a hope and a future. And that the picture I had inside, God would bring it to pass. And he did. I, you know, that's really good, everybody. The truth of God's word always supersedes the feelings you may be having at the time because feelings can lie. But the truth of God's word will change the way you feel, okay? Words change thoughts, but thoughts change the way you talk. So which one is it? Do my words change the way I think, or does the way I think change the way I talk? It works both ways, but words can always supersede those feelings when you speak what God says about you in faith. It supersedes it. Do you understand? It changes the way you feel because it changes the way you think about yourself over time. All right. You, two minutes each, all right? We got to close. So, um, Kevin, how much do you weigh? Just kidding. <laughs> Isn't he a handsome young man? I love this guy. He's awesome. He's a great guy, and he's you're the, just the right weight. He was a bas- he's a basketball <laughs> phenomenon. But do you recognize, you know, when those things try to come back in your life, what do you do about those, those uh, thoughts? You started to say, do I recognize it? And I wish I could say yes. No, I don't. And um, because, okay, let's face it, that the devil's been doing this a long time. And he knows how to get in your head. He knows how to plant just little, little thoughts that grow. And they, they fester and they, they get bigger. So I don't always recognize it. Once I do... I'd like to also say I handle it the right way, but not every time. Um, Mariah, you said a minute ago about uh, how you take the lies that the, te- that the devil uh, tries to put in your head and shares with you, and you reverse them. You believe the opposite, and that's what God told me when I was going through some really tough times years ago, and I've held on to that. And that's, that's what has helped me. This last year has been really tough. We had some because of some poor choices on my part, this last year has been really, really rough. And it was a year ago this month that, yeah. that things kind of came to a head. And I had to consciously choose what I said and what I thought yeah. and make it positive yeah. because there were some really dark times and I didn't know if we'd still be even be around this area. But choosing what you believe and what you, what you say and then surrounding yourself with people that will join you in that. Surrounding yeah. you with pe- yourself with people... This body, this group of this family, is amazing. Um, when we hit when we hit hit the wall about a, uh, a year ago, we we brought Russ and Judy Joe in in on the situation, and they came to our support. We went to people who we knew could support us and would support us, 
and it's been invaluable. There's a, there's a whole group here of, of family that, that are here to support each other, and that's, that's how I get through it. Amen, amen. Don, I'm going to let you give us your powerful last few thoughts on why you don't invite Ken and Armand to come back up. So I want to let you to know that for a long time, I managed my insecurity. I didn't deal with my insecurity <clears throat> because it was a body image issue. I could manage it through eating healthy, running, keeping fit. But when you get an injury, you can't do that anymore. And then that was challenged. And I didn't realize actually till yesterday when we were having a conversation that I had spent my lifetime managing my insecurity, th this particular insecurity. I hadn't really dealt with it until a few years ago when I actually got an injury and had to stop working out. And God wants us to deal with our insecurities. And he's so patient. He's gracious to wait till we're ready. He started to deal with this with me when I turned 40. And I'm 56 now. We're now, we're now just getting to the root of it because I'm now letting him back in that, in that space and not trying to manage it. We're dealing with it. And because I'm a coach, I'll end like this. Everybody has hit on what we need to do. We first go to God. Guys, God is about everything in your life. He cares if you think your thighs are too big. He cares if you think you're not smart enough or you can't feel like you do your money correctly. He cares about all those things. And what I do is I go to God first. I'm like, God, I can't do this. I talk to him like he's real because he is. That's what you do. The second thing, so if you don't know God today, this is a salvation message. You need to find him. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing is you invite the Holy Spirit to help you. He's your comforter. He's your strength. He's your power. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life, you need to get the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues because it is your power source. So you go to your power. You, you get your power on your side. You recognize that. And then you do all the things that they talked about. You watch the narrative in your head. You know what? I can't even look at my thighs in the mirror. And I'm going to cry. This is so dumb. <laughs> it's like the, but it's the silliest. You might think it's the silliest thing ever. But if I do, I will criticize them. In my own mind, I don't, I have to watch the narrative in my head. That's the first thing I see on myself. Crazy. Who looks at that? Look at your face. Look at your eyes. I don't know. But you're not a part of your body. You're a whole being. So you have to watch the narrative. You, you control your thoughts. I have to control my own thoughts about myself. And what I speak, pastor said it. What do you speak about yourself? I have a thing on my mirror. I have this thing called my green book. It's got all these things I need to speak about myself. I'm bold. I'm beautiful. Whatever I need to say for that day when I'm not feeling it, when I, when I look in the mirror, I have to say those things. I speak them into my life. It doesn't matter what I do. I mean, you would never know. Like you said, I don't act like that, but in my own mind, in my own self, that goes on in my life. So you speak it. You watch the narrative because it goes around and around and around like a cycle. And then I just want to say this. Every one of you has value. Your value is not based on what you do. You're not valued by what you look like. You're not valued by your size. You're not valued by your job. You're valued because what Paula said, you are in Christ. That is where our value comes from. And if you don't know that, do what Paula did. You meditate on it. You think about it. You speak it. You see yourself full of value. Because I could look every one of you in the face right now, and like Pastor Judy Joe said, you're going through something, you've been through something, you have to know you're valued for who you are as a child of God. And when we pick ourselves apart, we're picking apart God's creation. When we think a negative about ourselves, we're God's creation. Who am I to tell God you didn't do a good enough job? Okay, so in closing, for my part, you are valued. God has created you, and you have a destiny. Don't let anything keep you from that. You make that choice, like Mariah said. You choose to. I, I challenge you. I'm a coach, so this is what I do. I challenge you today. Choose to make the decision that no longer is insecurity going to control your life. So good. You know, you know what we're doing here today? We're redefining us is what we're doing, right? And in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand up. And when you stand up, I want you to make that an outward sign of you putting on the brakes of whatever that thought has been that comes against you saying you're anything other than what God sees you, right? I, I believe it was Paula who texted me this week about if only you could see you how God sees you. Have you ever asked God, God, how do you see me? 
That alone will change the narrative right there, friends, because I promise you, he sees so much more than you see. Amen? And so I'm going to give you a little fuel for this right now. Colossians 3.12 says you're loved. Ephesians 1.7 says you're forgiven. 1 Peter 2.9 says you're chosen. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says you're a new creation. Romans 8.1 says you're not condemned. Romans 8.37 says you're more than a conqueror. Ephesians 2.10 says you're God's workmanship. Philippians 4.19 says you're provided for. And 1 Corinthians 15, 7, 57 says you are victorious. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, what is that mirror? It's the word of God you've been hearing this morning, are being transformed into him, his image from glory to glory. And for all of us up here, except for Mariah today, who are already past 50, we encourage you, don't wait to redefine you. Stop that. Stop the negative narrative now. Stop it this morning. Say no more to those lies that you know are not true. And it's not the way God sees you. And step on over on the victory side. Amen. I'm going to ask you, will you stand with me this morning? And will you put your your foot down to whatever the lie has been that you're not enough that you don't look good enough that you're not kind enough you're not smart enough you're not successful enough you're not financially there uh-uh you are listen to me you are enough you are enough and he in you is all you need amen amen guys let's go ahead and sing